Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for our study tonight once again. Thank you for the love of the word you have given unto us. And thank you for the faithfulness of those who are coming every time. Today, as we come before your word and by your spirit, we're praying that you teach us your word in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that your spirit will take these words, explain, apply to every heart and every life in Jesus' name. Be with us, Lord, as we study. And for those who are still coming, we pray that they join us in time so we can have fellowship around your word together in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everybody said... Uh, you know, I'm going to tell you to speak loud if you don't uh, say it loud enough. We are now in study two. Today we're in Revelation chapter one. And we're looking at verses four, five, and six. Last week we started the study of the book of Revelation. And we saw something that it was the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. God gave it to him. And it was symbolized or signified by angels giving it to John. And then it says, John bore record. In verse 3, we are told, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, as we come to the second study, we're looking at chapter 1, verse 4. Verse 5, verse 6, read with me. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the th his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us kings and priests unto God, and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Today we're looking at Christ's grace, glory, and dominion. In the introduction to this revelation, John indicates the first recipients of the message, that is, the people that the book of Revelation first got to. It says in that passage we read in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. The first people to read this, or the first people to get the message, these were the seven churches in Asia Minor. As you go down to verse 11, we're told, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Here are the seven. Number one, unto Ephesus. And number two, unto Smyrna. And number three, unto Pergamos. And number four, unto Tatira. And number five, unto Sardis. Number six, unto Philadelphia. Number seven, unto Laodicea. But you will understand that this message, that is the book of Revelation, and the revelation we have therein, is not limited to the seven churches of Asia Minor alone. Why do we say that? Look at chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. That means then, the message is not just for those seven churches. Anyone, in any generation, any dispensation, until the coming of the Lord, this message is addressed unto them. Not only that, in every one of those messages, as you come to the end of each message to each church, the message is, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. 
Verse 11. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. That's repeated in verse 17. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. In verse 29. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Going on to chapter 3 and in verse... Um, in verse 6, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. In verse 13, the same thing, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And then in verse 22, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. You will see that the plan, the purpose, the intention of Christ was not to limit the message to those churches only. It was to give the message to all churches, everyone that will read, everyone that will hear. That's why the message in this revelation is not limited to just those seven churches in Asia Minor. In Revelation chapter 13, reading there in verse 9, If any man have an ear, let him hear. Any man, anyone, anytime, anywhere, in any generation, if any man has an ear, let him hear. The question then is, if that is so, that the message was meant for all the churches, why just seven? You need to understand that as you come to the book of Revelation, seven is a very common number. It's used very many times. As you read through the book, you have seven churches. You have the seven spirits. You have the seven golden candlesticks. You have the seven stars and the seven lamps and the seven seals and the seven horns, the seven eyes, the seven trumpets and the seven thunders, the seven vials or bowls, the seven mountains and the seven kings. And then as you read through the book, you are going to find out there are seven blessedness, that is, beatitudes. Then seven years of judgment and seven I am's of Christ, seven doxologies, that is, praise and glory to the Lord in heaven. The question is, why is seven so prominent? As we read through, the number seven represents fullness, completion, and perfection. The seven churches then were chosen to represent all the churches. The message of the book of Revelation is for the whole church in every age until Christ will come. As we look at the message today, chapter 1, verses 4, uh, verses 4, 5, and 6, we're going to divide into three parts. Number one, grace and peace from the triune God. That is, from God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Number two, gratitude and praise to the redeeming God. Gratitude and praise to the redeeming God. And then number three, glory and power ascribed to the Son of God. In number one, which is grace and peace from the triune God. Let's read again chapter one, verse four, and the first part of verse five. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the uh, and the prince of the kings of the earth. You will see here it's greeting the church. Not only greeting the church or the churches, it's also sending blessing to them. It's asking for the grace of God and the peace of God to come unto on, them. But it's being sent from the divine trinity. That is the fullness of the Godhead, the Father. That is, it says, grace unto you and peace. From who now? From him which is and which was and which is to come. That's God the Father. Not only from God the Father, from God the Holy Spirit and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Not only before the Holy Spirit or from the Holy Spirit, but from Jesus Christ also. That is, Jesus, the very Son of God, and is God the Son, God himself. And from Jesus, who is the faithful witness, and from the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. And look at those personalities in the Godhead one by one. First, we have God the Father. Him which is, which was. 
and which is to come. As we check up other references of scripture, you will find that that kind of title or that kind of attribute is describing God Almighty. That is God the Father. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. And the four beasts, that is the four living creatures, have each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That's God the Father, which was and is and is to come so then you understand when it refers to him who was and is and is to come it's referring to god almighty himself in revelation chapter 11 revelation chapter 11 reading from verse 17 saying we give thee thanks o lord god almighty Again, when it mentions God, Lord Almighty, it's referring to God the Father. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our own Father by faith after we are repented of our sins. O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. You are convinced then that when we read, he who was and is, and is to come is referring to god almighty the heavenly father in revelation chapter 16 revelation chapter 16 reading from verse 5 and i heard the angel of the water say thou art righteous o lord which art and wast and shall be because thou hast thus judged Come back to Revelation chapter 1 in verse 4. The grace and the peace of God is coming from him who was and is and is to come. So you understand then that God, the Heavenly Father, wants and desires that will have his grace. The eternal God referred to as he who is, who was, and who is to come from eternal past unto the eternal future he is ever the same that's why that kind of title is used for him and is the everlasting father the eternal one and the infinite one the omnipotent one and he is the same in absoluteness of his unchanging nature and his eternal existence now we come to the second personality in the godhead as it is mentioned in revelation chapter 1 verse 4 Come back to Revelation 1 verse 4. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Well, you say, but we know we have one Holy Ghost. You are right. And that same Holy Ghost is referred to as the Holy Spirit. That is right. Why then do we have the seven spirits which are before the throne? Well, you need to understand that the book of Revelation is very symbolic indeed. And the number seven is symbolic. I told you already that that number seven means fullness. It means completeness. And it means perfection. And in referring to the Holy Spirit, it's referring to the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. You look, at, look at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Reading from verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding and a spirit of counsel and might and a spirit of, of knowledge and of the fear of the lord if you look at this is the same holy spirit but this holy spirit number one is the spirit of the lord number two this holy spirit is the spirit of wisdom number three this holy spirit is a spirit of understanding number four this same holy spirit is a spirit of counsel Number five, this same Holy Spirit is a spirit of might. Number six, this same Holy Spirit is a spirit of knowledge. Number seven, this Holy Spirit is a spirit of the fear of the Lord. That's why it refers to him as the seven spirit that are before the throne of God. Because of the sevenfold ministry 
of that Holy Spirit. And because of the symbolism, the imagery that is used in the book of Revelation. So it's referring to the Holy Spirit and the grace and the peace of God is coming from this, from God on high. And from the Spirit of God as well. Come to Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. Revelation chapter 5. Verse 6, and I, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the, four be, of the four beasts, that is the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, totality of power. And seven eyes, that's the completeness, perfection of knowledge, and which are the seven spirits of God, saints, forth into all the earth. Jesus had the perfection, the fullness, the completeness of the power of the Spirit of God. That's why we're told here the Lamb had the seven eyes and the seven arms and the seven spirits of God. So, when we read about the seven spirits of God, it's the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit that is referring to and the Holy Ghost in its totality. The Holy Ghost in its fullness, in its perfection, in its completeness is telling us that we can have the grace of God. We can have the peace of God. God. And when the Holy Spirit in his glory, in his fullness, in his perfection, desires and bestows grace and peace on the church and on every member of the church, then you know that we can really have the peace of God, the grace of God in our lives. And we find that grace and that peace sufficient for every need. And then we come back to chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 5. It says, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Here is Jesus Christ. It's a very, very clear. To start with, have you noticed? When it says in verse 4. From him which is, which was, and which is to come. You, are, or you might have said, maybe that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ also has that same attribute. Because when you're thinking of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, their attributes are very, very similar. But you see, Jesus Christ is mentioned separately in verse 5 from Jesus Christ. And what are the characteristics of Jesus Christ? As we're told in verse 5. He has many other characteristics, but the one that is uh, emphasized here, the one that is focused on here, underlined here, is that he's a faithful witness. Number two, is the first begotten from the dead. Number three, is the prince of the kings of the earth. As we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see him as the faithful witness. That's exactly what the Lord had promised. Many, many years before, in fact, about 700 years before Jesus Christ came into this world. In Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 4. Isaiah, chapter 55, in verse 4. And behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, and a leader and commander to the people. A leader and commander to the people. I've given him for a witness. But he came to witness to the truth. That's why he's a faithful witness. In John chapter 18, John chapter 18, at the time before he was crucified at the betrayal, when they were questioning him, here came the question, and then the answer came from the Lord. In John chapter 18, verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Are thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou seest that I am a king. To this end, that means for this purpose, for this reason, was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness Unto the truth, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. The Lord Jesus Christ emphasized that he was the one that came to bear witness. He came to bear witness to the truth. No wonder he's introduced here as the one that is the faithful witness. Psalm 89. Psalm 89, reading from verse 27. As the Lord was promising David... But he was looking ahead to this son of David. You remember in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is referred to as a son of David. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. You find that prayer in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 15. Now in, in Psalm, Psalm 89, 
verse 27. It says, and I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Higher than the kings of the earth. Here we are told that Jesus Christ is a faithful witness and is the first begotten of the dead and is the prince of the kings of the earth. And it says, I will make him my firstborn. What does that mean, by the way? When it says he is the first begotten from the dead. As you look at uh, the Old Testament, you'll find that some people rose up after they had died. Even in the New Testament, you know about Lazarus and some others that rose up after they died. But you know that all those people, they went back and they died later, much later. But Jesus Christ, he died and then he rose again, never to die again. And death had no power, had no dominion over him after he rose from the dead. He is the first begotten of the dead. The one that rose in that way and didn't die again. The chief or the highest among those who had risen from the dead. In Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 18. And is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. That is, he was preeminent among the people that had risen from the dead. He was much, much above the rest. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, because Jesus Christ is also referred to as a prince, the ruler, the king of the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter, chapter 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords, and King of kings. And they that are with him are called, and chosen, and faithful. Here we are told that Jesus Christ will be referred to as the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. Revelation 19, 16. And he has on his vesture and on his tie a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So you find that Jesus Christ has been called by three titles here. Number one, the faithful witness. Number two, the false begotten of the dead. Number three, the prince of the kings of the earth. As the faithful witness, he testified and is still testifying to the eternal truth of God. And he was himself truth personified. He died bearing witness to the truth. And he rose from the dead, the first begotten, the preeminent of all who are raised from the dead. And he, Christ, is the prince, the ruler, the king, or the kings of the earth. When we refer to Jesus Christ as king, the New Testament shows him, and then the Old Testament too, as king in various ways. One is called the king of the Jews. Number two is called the king of Israel. Number three is called the king of glory. Number four is called the king of the saints. And then is the king of kings. By virtue of his atoning work, in the power of his resurrection from the dead, and in his royal authority, of his eternal kingship, Jesus pronounces grace and peace on us. Grace and peace. Come back to Revelation chapter 1. As we look at Revelation chapter 1, we find that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, they, they have desire that we have the grace of God, the fullness of the grace of God, and that we have peace, the fullness of the peace of God. How much grace can you have? Number one, you can have saving grace by which you come to know the Lord and you are born again. Number two, you can have sustaining grace that whatever the trial, whatever the persecution, whatever the pressure, whatever the opposition, and whatever the temptation you have in your life, the grace of God can sustain you. There is sustaining grace. Number three, there is sanctifying grace. Number four, there is sufficient grace. As we talk about the grace of God, and that's what the Lord is saying here. It says grace. 
unto you, and peace from him, which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. When it says you can have grace, I told you already, you can have saving grace, sustaining grace, sanctifying grace, and sufficient grace. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 8. The grace of God made available for you and for me. It says in verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The gift of God. That is the grace of God made available for everyone that will call on the name of the Lord. But it's not just that you have the grace of God at salvation. That grace of God is able to sanctify you, purify you, and take away the Adamic nature out of your heart and make you to live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. In Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. That's what the grace of God does. It sustains us. With all the corruption in the world, all the pollution in the world, the grace that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the grace that they are bestowing upon us is to make us deny what they lost. And to make us deny the, 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 the ungodliness in the world. And the grace of God is to equip us, energize us, empower us, so that we can live righteously and godly and unblameably in this present world. Then in verse 14, who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. That's what the grace of God does. To redeem us. To save us. And separate us. And cleanse us. And purge us from all iniquity. And to purify unto himself a peculiar people. Zealous of good works. The grace of God does not stop there. It continues to say that the grace of God can be sufficient for every moment of need in your life. Temptation, pressure, conflict, whatever challenge you are facing in your life, the grace of God is sufficient. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading to you from verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Would you remember that? Anytime you are facing trial, anytime you are facing temptation, anytime it appears that the pressure on you will crush out your Christian life and you will not be able to stand, anytime it appears that there is something that is walking there out from the world that is going to send you away from the grace of God and that you will not be able to stand, remember we can come to the throne of grace. And the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost already bestowed the grace of God upon us. And then you can be what you ought to be. First Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 10. And by the grace, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. You can be all that you ought to be. Whatever challenge you face. Whatever sin may be in your life. And whatever it is that the Lord wants you to do, there is no ministry the Lord has called you to that you cannot, you cannot fulfill because it says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. As you look at Revelation chapter 1, and you see what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what the triune God is bestowing upon us. Grace unto you, and peace from him, which is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Then he says again, not only grace, but peace. Peace is available. The peace that we have with God. 
and the peace we have in our hearts and the peace that passes understanding and the peace he wants us to have among ourselves and within ourselves as we talk about the peace well you know that in the world there is no peace in the families in the world there is no peace in clubs in the world, there is no peace. In countries in the world, there is no peace. Internationally, there is no peace. But when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're given peace. Because Jesus Christ himself is referred to, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. is referred to as the prince of peace, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, is the Father of Eternity, because he's been there from all eternity, and he is the Prince of Peace. And it is because of his death, that's how we're able to have peace, peace with God, and the peace of God. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, reading from verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgression, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And that's the reason as we go to the New Testament in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. It tells us that Christ now is our peace by virtue of his death for you and for me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he is our peace, who has made but one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. He has broken down the middle wall of partition between us and God, and he has broken down the middle wall of partition between the Jews and the Gentiles. And therefore, we're able to have peace with God, and we're able to have peace one with another because of what he has done. That's why he himself said in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. His own kind of peace, perfect peace. The peace that makes your heart to be at rest. No worry. No anxiety. No fear. No turmoil. No conflict within. Everything is peaceful. Your sins are forgiven. Being justified by faith, you have peace with God. And the peace of God settles in your heart. And it says, when you come to him, Anything happening in the world, anything happening around you, storm, whatever it is, my own peace, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. It's, to, it's telling us about the kind of peace we have when we actually trust the Lord. When we're resting in the Lord. When we're trusting and leaning upon him. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. It says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. When we trust in the Lord, you are born again, you are a child of God, you are leaning upon the Lord. It says, he gives you his peace. And then as you are leaning and trusting him, perfect peace will he give you. In fact, the way the New Testament describes it in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Amen. So in Revelation, let's come back to Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, in verses 4 and 5, it tells us the benediction, the grace, and the peace we have from the Lord John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you. May the grace of God be with you. And peace uh, be with you as well. From him which is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from, the, from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Now we go to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at gratitude and praise to the redeeming God. Gratitude. And praise to the redeeming God. The latter part of verse 5, it says, Unto him that loved us 
and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and to his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we have the, a grateful heart. A grateful heart. And we're praising the name of the Lord. Why are we praising the name of the Lord? These verses contain the reasons for our praise and for our gratitude to God and to Christ our Savior and Redeemer. And there are three things you'll find here that we focus on. Number one, he loved us. Unto him that loved us. Number two, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. He cleansed us. He forgave us. He removed our sins. We are redeemed from the chains and the shackles of sin. And we are cleansed and purged and washed from our own sins. Number three, he made us kings and priests unto God and his father. I need to tell you that these three things, you cannot swap them around. That means you cannot interchange them. They are in sequence. Number one takes place first. After that, you have number two. After that, you have number three. What does that mean? It means, number one, he loved us first. He loved us first. It was after he loved us, he now washed us from our sins in his own blood. And it was after the cleansing, the washing, the conversion, that now he has made us kings and priests unto God and unto his Father, unto him that loved us. What a remarkable thing, that he should love us. He loved us first, even before washing us. It's not that after he had washed us, then he loved us. When we didn't merit his love, when we were unlovable, when we were sinners, he loved us. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And then you will appreciate what the Lord has done for you. And what the Lord has done for other people like you, if they are born again. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, defiled, unclean, polluted, still sinful, still unrighteous, and still unholy, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So then you understand, he loved us even before we were washed from our sins. And then he tells us that it's after that now he's made us kings and priests unto the Father, unto the Lord God in heaven. He loved us while, while we were unclean and defiled. He loves us now after washing us and bringing us to himself. And bef before going to the cross, he loved us. While on the cross, he still loved us. He died for our sins. Going up to glory, now seated on the throne of God above, he loves us. And when the earth and the present universe would have gone out of existence, he will still continue to love us. The love of God. Unsurpassing love. Hey, look at the way uh, Paul celebrated the love of God for himself. And the way you ought to celebrate the love of God for yourself. Just forget everything around you now and concentrate on the love of God. He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God the Father. In 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he, he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now he recounts what he was and who he was. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and an injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That is the greatest of sinners to be saved in his own reckoning. He was celebrating the love of God. Rejoicing in the love of God. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, what surprises you or what, what encourages you in the life of Paul the Apostle? After he became an apostle and after he was used mightily, he still remembered that when he was unlovable was when the Lord loved him. Would you then remember also that the days when you were still a sinner, when you had nothing to recommend you before God, but the Lord loved you. 
the Lord loved you and called you to himself. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. It says the reason why he gave himself a sacrifice to God, the reason why he went to the cross to die, the reason why he shed his blood so that you can be washed from your sins is because he loved you first. First John chapter 3 verse 16. First John chapter 3 verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. That's how we understand. That's how we perceive the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us. As you look at what we're told in Revelation chapter 1. Reading from verse 5 through to verse 6. It says, number one, he loved us. Number two now, unto him that washed us from our own our sins in his own blood it says over here he washed us from our sins in his blood washed us washed us look at first corinthians first corinthians chapter 6 Reading from verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 6. Reading from verse 9. So you understand what he washed us from. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. He mentions people here. These are the things that defile us. These are the things that make us dirty. You know, in the natural and the physical, when you feel dirty, when you look dirty, you go for a wash, you wash yourself. Spiritually, adultery makes us dirty. Fornication makes us dirty. A fem being effeminate, that is, you are a man, you are dressing like a woman, looking like a woman, that makes you dirty. It's abomination in the sight of the Lord. If you are abusers of themselves with mankind, homosexuals, lesbians, it makes you dirty. Lesbianism. Then thieves when you steal, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners, shall, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then it says, and such was some of you, but ye are washed. And such was some of you, but ye are washed. It is uh, the sin that has been in our lives that made us dirty, that the Lord Jesus Christ washed us from. You look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Reading from verse 20. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, abortion included, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, Lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride. Do you know pride makes you defiled? Do you know that pride makes you dirty, unclean in the sight of God? And foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, reading from verses 4 to 5. Titus 3, 4 and 5. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The sins that had been in our lives were washed from them. Were cleansed from them. 
and those things are taken away. Actually, this is what the Lord had promised years before. And now in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, He fulfills for those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, long time promise of the Lord that made the people of God to be expecting that this is the kind of cleansing and washing that the Lord will do. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That's why the Lord is telling us, is inviting us, that he wants to wash us, he loves you very dearly. And because he loves you, he wants to wash all your sins away. He wants to take all your sins away so that in his sight, you will be clean. In Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, red, deep, makes you dirty and abominable in the sight of God. Though they be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Then he says, if you are willing and you are obedient, that is you turn away from your sin and you turn to the Lord, you will eat the good of the land. The cleansing will be yours, the pardon will be yours, the peace will be yours, the salvation of the Lord will be yours as well. Uh, that's why you need to come to the Lord. It is not by the work of righteousness which we have done, but it is the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. We did not work for it. We did not labor for the cleansing, for the washing. By faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, we are washed, we are cleansed, and we are forgiven. That translates to our salvation. We are saved. That's why I'm asking you, and the Lord is asking you. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? It is not your good works that will wash you, that will cleanse you. It is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that is shed on the cross of Calvary. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you see the cleansing, the washing? Has He made you clean in your conscience, in your heart, in your spirit, and your life totally anew? When the bridegroom comes, will your robe will be white, pure and white in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bride? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? This is what you need to do. You lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, stained with adultery, with fornication, with pride, with wickedness, with malice, with backbiting. Lay aside the garments stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There is a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? There are three things I told you I showed you in the Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Number 1, he loved us. Number 2, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. Number 3, he's made us kings and priests unto God the Father. He made us kings and priests unto God the Father. This has been his aim. This has been his plan from the Old Testament. Although the Old Testament people did not fully yield to him, now he has revived and renewed that plan again, wanting to make us kings and priests unto the Lord God our Father. In Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and verse 6, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. A kingdom of priests and an holy and holy nation. In First Peter chapter 2. The intention of the Lord, the plan of the Lord, the promise of the Lord, the desire of the Lord. To make you kings unto himself and to make us priests unto himself. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9. 
But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Why? What for? That ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see what he wants to do? A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, priests and kings. When you talk about kings, you talk about royalty. Priest, that's the priesthood. A royal priesthood, an holy nation, then a peculiar people. And the reason is so that you'll be able to minister to the Lord, shining forth and showing forth the praises and the glory of the Lord. In Revelation chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, and he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I said we shall reign on the earth. Amen. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And you will see here what the Lord said he will do. The promise he has given us. And please remember, this will be for the people that overcome. They overcome Satan. They overcome the world. They overcome the flesh. They overcome temptation. They overcome every form of uh, en en enticement to sin. And they stay faithful, righteous unto the Lord until the end of their lives. Those people, they will be kings and they will be priests forever unto the Lord. And can you see once again the order here? Number one, you are washed from your sins in his own blood. After that, you become kings and priests unto the Lord. Pardon before priesthood. There are some people that rush into priesthood. They want to be priests unto the Lord, kings unto the Lord. And they want to be in the prayer warrior, casting out devils, manifesting authority, where the word of the king is, there's authority. Would you please remember, he washes you from your sins first. It's after you are cleansed from your sin. You are washed from your sin. And there is pardon. Then you have priesthood. Look at it this way. You have cleansing before commissioning. He will never crown you or commission you or have coronation to be a king and to be a priest unto the Lord. You'll never have the commission of the Lord to serve as priest unto the Lord until you are cleansed. First of all, he has washed us from our sins in his own blood. After that, he has made us kings and priests unto our God. There are many people that rush into the ministry and they want to do this and do that. And yet they are not free from sin. Do you understand here is a great honor, a great honor to be called a king and to be called a priest unto the Lord. But please remember, holiness before honor. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. They that bear the vessel of the Lord, depart, depart ye from evil. You must have the cleansing, the purging, the purifying before you have the honor to be a king and a priest unto the Lord. What we are saying is salvation and sanctification before service salvation and sanctification before service if any man therefore purge himself from this it shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified meat for the master's use therefore you, you make sure you are saved Make sure you are sanctified. Make sure that sin, private sin, public sin, open sin, inward sin, everything has been taken away. Sanctification before service. Righteousness before reigning with Christ. Yes, he makes us kings. And we shall reign with him. And we shall reign over all the earth. But before you can reign, there will be righteousness. Please understand then that our character, our Christian life matters a lot before we can claim to be kings and priests before the Lord our God. I come to point number three. Glory and power ascribed to the Son of God. Here we come in verse 6 and it says to him, be glory and dominion forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Now, as we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, he has the right, he has the authority to claim everlasting praise because he is exalted and honored by the Father. And those who are redeemed by him worship and adore him. 
And you will see as you look at the watch of God that honor and glory, they belong unto the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, What is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing? That's what belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because of what he has done in Second Timothy. Second Timothy, reading from chapter 4. Verse 18, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me, shall deliver you from every evil work. And will preserve me, will preserve you unto his everlasting heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Be because of what he has done and because of what he is still doing, we are to give him glory. And we are to praise his name. We are to magnify his name. Not magnify yourself. Magnify the Lord. Don't lift up yourself. Lift up the Lord. Lift him up. Lift him up. Still he says from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Let your life show that he has dominion over you. Let your life show that he has glory in your life and that he will be glorified. Whether you are in the private or you are in the public, in your heart, it should be glorified. In your home, it should be glorified. And in your family, it should be glorified. Through all your actions, it should be glorified. Not only now, not only this year, but for the rest of your life. And when you eventually go to get to heaven, you'll keep on giving glory unto God forever and ever. In First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praised, that is this Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Redeemer, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. In chapter... Chapter 5, verse 11. Chapter 5, verse 11. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Then he tells us in Jude, verse 25. Jude, verse 25. In Jude, verse 25, it says, To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. As you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, you see that the Lord Jesus Christ now should have glory in your life and should have dominion over your life. But the time is coming when his dominion will be for, uh, will cover the whole earth. And his dominion will be forever and ever. And that dominion and glory will come with his kingdom. An everlasting eternal kingdom. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Reading from verse 13. Daniel 7 verse 13. I saw in the night vision. And behold one like the son of man. Came with the clouds of heaven. And came to the all to the ancient of days, and they brought him near unto him. That is, they brought the Son of Man near to the ancient of days. That is, they brought Jesus Christ in this revelation, in this vision. They brought him to God, the ancient of days, the Almighty God. And there was given him dominion and glory. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. That all people and nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, with that which shall not be destroyed. You will be in that kingdom. And I will be in that kingdom. The condition of being in that kingdom is that you surrender your life to him right now. 
and you yield him complete uh, complete allegiance and loyalty and faithfulness and you allow him to have dominion you have him you allow him to have glory even at this very time and you allow him to purge your sin to take your sins away and you allow him to even reach deep within you the adamic nature that thing that is raising up its ugly head every time there is something a little thing that doesn't uh, you know that doesn't go your way the thing that rises up as if you are going to fight as if you are going to have anger the sin that rises up there you allow him to crush everything take everything away and relax in the sight of god and surrender everything to the lord so that he can have glory and dominion in your life so that the study we're having will not just be that we study it in the head and it is not implanted in our hearts that's why it says in hebrews chapter 13 verses 20 and 21 hebrews 13 verses 20 and 21 now the god of peace that brought again from the dead our lord jesus the great that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect you know we will be talking about what god can do and what god wants to do and many times as the lord is saying this is what i want to do your life is imperfect your attitude is imperfect. Your disposition is imperfect. Your thoughts are imperfect. Come on here. I want to make you perfect so that I can have glory and dominion in your life. So that my name will be exalted in your life. And my honor will be exalted in your life. And the only thing that you see will be the glory of God and the dominion of God. And you will not have your way, but you will have my way and my will every time. I want to do a walk in you so that I will have glory and dominion in your life. Since the Lord has been telling you for some time now over and over message after message have you gone to the lord have you surrendered before the lord have you yielded yourself to the lord have you opened the door of your heart to the lord saying oh god i want you to have glory i want you to have dominion rule over every area of my life no more my will but what you want make you perfect in every good world to do his will walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to him be glory forever and ever amen before you go tonight will you surrender your life to the lord and look at these areas of your life where God is not having the victory, where God is not having dominion, where God is not having the glory. And say, God, I'm sorry. Walk in me tonight. Before I go, walk in me. Touch me once again. Purify me once again. Let the blood of Jesus Christ do a perfect work, a complete work. Finish this work tonight so that, Lord, my life, my heart, my thought, my disposition, my character, everything I do in private and in public, in church and at home, anywhere in the office, in the marketplace, so that my life will bring glory to you and you'll have dominion, you'll have majesty, and you'll have power over my life. I surrender my life to you tonight. Do it as it pleases you. Rise up and talk to the lord let him have the glory let him have the glory no more you being glorified let it be the lord not your way not your way not your will but the will of the lord so that the lord can be glorified so that the lord can have glory so that the lord can have dominion in every area of your life surrender everything to the lord tonight don't struggle with the lord anymore not my will not my way Not my glory. Not sell. Not sell. Let self die. Let self die. Let God have dominion. That's what He wants in our lives. He loves us, let's love Him. He loves us, let's love Him. Let's surrender everything to Him. Stop struggling. Stop having your way. All the defilement in your life, the uncleanness in your life, surrender to the Lord. He wants to wash you from your sins in his own blood. Let him purge and purify you.
Let him wash you from your own sins. Any pride there? Anger is still there. Bitterness still there. Abomination of the Gentiles still there. Deception and lying still there. Hypocrisy, lip service still there. Let him wash you. Let him cleanse you. In his own blood. Is it religion without righteousness? Let him wash you. Let him cleanse you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And he wants to cleanse you. He wants to wash you. When are you going to allow the Lord to do this work in you? To make you holy through and through. Righteous through and through. So that he can be exalted in your life. So that it's no more what you want. How you want. Where you want. But let the Lord be glorified and honored in your life. Let him have dominion. The blood of Jesus Christ can wash you and make you whiter than snow. If it has not happened, it's because you are not yielding yourself to him. Who is having dominion in your life? Who is having dominion in your heart? Who is having dominion in your home? Let Jesus have dominion. Let him set up his rule, his reign, his kingdom in your heart. And let Jesus reign without a rival. Let Jesus rule without a rival. Let him reign. Let him rule. Let him be honored. Let him be glorified. Your language, your dressing, your attitude, your behavior, your relationships, in your profession, in your office. In your friendship and fellowship. Everywhere you go, everything you do. Let Jesus reign. Don't let sin have dominion over you. Let Jesus have dominion over you. Don't let self have dominion over you. Let Jesus have dominion over you. Don't let Satan have dominion over you. Let Jesus have dominion over you. Reign, Master Jesus. Reign, Master Jesus. Let Jesus have dominion. Don't allow this Adamic nature, self-will, disobedience. Don't let all these things have dominion over your life. Let Jesus have dominion. To him be glory and dominion now and forever. Let Jesus set his kingdom in your heart. Let Jesus set his dominion, his reign, his kingdom in your heart. 
So the people that see you, the people that know you, the people that observe you, they will know it's not self having dominion. It's Christ having dominion. They will know it is not the loss of the flesh having dominion. It's Christ having dominion. It's not money having dominion over you. It's Christ having dominion over you. Don't let the love of money reign in your life. Let it be Jesus. Let Jesus have glory and dominion. He loves you. If you present yourself to him, he will wash you from all sin. This falling and rising, falling and rising will stop. You live a consistent, holy, righteous, upright life. He will wash you from your sin. Cleanse you from your sin. Purge you from your sin. He has to pardon you before he brings you into the priesthood. He has to save and sanctify you before he can really make use of your service. If you are not saved, your service is useless in the sight of God. If you are not sanctified, your service is unacceptable in the sight of God. Let him save and sanctify you, then he will bring you into service. There should be conversion before commissioning. Consecrate your life to the Lord before He can commission you into ministry. From now on, you offer your life. Praise unto the Lord. So, He alone. Be glorified will have dominion in your life.